Meanwhile, I try to put myself in a better environment. I hope you can see it now. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be at least virtually there in Milan. And uh, I hope that uh, the, the talk will go technically smoothly, but again, so do expect uh, any possible disruptions. Um, so uh, I believe that I have about an hour for the talk or excluding discussion or including discussion. How, um, how do you usually? It should be 50 min minutes, but if you need 10 minutes more, I mean, uh, sure. we're not too strict. But in any case, you are welcome to interrupt me with, with questions, clarifying and any other questions, so we can do it interactive. OK, so right, I'm going to talk about logic based strategic reasoning with normative constraints, so let me give you some some context. Uh, so consider a society of rational agents, whatever that means, who act and interact in pursuit of their own individual, collective, and societal objectives. And the big question that I'm going to address in, in a specific uh, context today is, what can we say about uh, their abilities to achieve goals by acting strategically? And now the important point to make now is that agents in a society act strategically in what they call their social context. And uh, that include both their friends and uh, enemies, but also uh, many other unknown agents who need not be treated a priori as either of the two. So they just go about their own business. Now, furthermore, the social context also involves a system of individual and collective normative constraints, such as permissions, obligations, prohibitions, and are uh, all these constraint accordingly the agent's behavior? So that agent's strategic social behavior is determined not only by their objectives, but also by the existing social norms and by their social attitude, whether they are cooperative or selfish, whether they are norm abiding or not, and so on. And now, talking about things, I'll focus on normative constraints on agents' actions rather than on the possible states of the, of the, of the system as such. And uh, a typical such normative constraint is of the type uh, the agent may or must or may not perform an action satisfying a given condition C. So that we are interested in reasoning about agents' abilities of the following type. The agent or a group of agents has a strategy to achieve an objective while all agents act in compliance with the given normative constraints. So uh, that calls for what I call strategic reasoning in social context with normative constraints. And uh, the purpose of this talk is to show to you how formal logic can be useful for capturing such reasoning. So I'll start this with, uh, well, I've already had the introduction, but I'll start with some background on models and logic for logics for strategic reasoning in multi-agent systems. So I'll give you a brief overview on some back background, which I presume that uh, at least some of you do not have. Uh, and then I will proceed with the main topic, namely modeling first multi-agent systems with normative constraints, and then introducing a certain logic of, of uh, strategic reasoning with such normative constraints. <clears throat> so uh, this talk is pretty much based on work in progress, and uh, I mention here just two recent precursors uh, of this work, but uh, the, what I'll present today has not been published yet. And so uh, any comments in particular, critical comments would be uh, most welcome and will be appreciated. Better now than later. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right, first the background. Now, uh, the concept of multi agent system would be the uh, fundamental one behind much of what I'll say today. So, let me say a few words about what I mean. 
Uh, Multi-agent system, intuitively, that's uh, just a set of agents acting in a common environment, which we call the system or the playground, in pursuit of their goals by following individual collective strategies possibly. So this is a really very, uh, very broad generic concept, and there are many diverse examples like, well, multiplayer games, of course, but also teams of robots and distributed systems, computer networks, but also social groups and networks, institutions, business companies, markets, and so on. So to quote William Shakespeare from his play, As You Like It, saying, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Uh, what I think he actually meant to say is that all the world is a multi-agent system and we all are merely agents in it. Now, uh, I am going to introduce first intuitively and then formally kind of abstract model of, of uh, multi-agent systems, which goes under two names. One is a multi-agent transition system. So what is this? Well, again, we have a, a, a set of agents or players. I'll be using these two words as synonyms in, in this talk that act in this common environment, which I'll call the system, by taking actions in a discrete succession of rounds. So that at any moment the system is in a current state. And at that current state, each of the agents takes an action or chooses an action from a set of actions that are available to that agent. And so these actions are assumed to be performed simultaneously or at least independently, so that there is one collective action that is that is being uh, th that takes place. And uh, this collective action causes a transition from the current state to a new successor state where the same happens. So again, each agent chooses an action, the collective action will result into a new transition and so on, possibly for it. So that this dynamics is captured by the, the concept of multi-agent transition system. And these can also be viewed as models of concurrent multiplayer games. So that there is the obvious game theoretic perspective what I'll present here, but I will not uh, discuss it further in this talk. Now, here is a simple kind of a typical example that I use for uh, this background. So maybe some of you have already seen it, apologies if so. Now, uh, here is a story behind the picture. So there are two robots, Yin and Yang, that are pushing a trolley along a track of trucks. And so these trucks are represented by the lines that you see on this picture. And uh, the circles represent the possible locations or states where the trolley can be uh, positioned. And so uh, Yin can only push in a clockwise direction and Yang can only push in anti-clockwise direction with the same force. It's just the story behind the picture. So uh, again, what you see here is a transition system. So there are states and there are transitions which are indicated by these arrows. Now, what is new and specific here is that every transition is labeled, in this case, by a pair of actions. In general, it will be a tuple of actions. So, for instance, if the system is, or the trolley is currently in the state, the location S0, then each of the two robots has uh, two possible actions at that state, push or wait. Uh, so, if both of them for instance, decide to wait, then nothing happens when the trolley stays in the same position. If both decide to push, then because they push in opposite directions with the same force, then again, the trolley will stay in the same position. So the transition is to the same, uh, to the same location. By the way, can you see my mouse when I'm showing something with my mouse? You can see, okay, good. Uh, and so, for instance, if the first one, Ian, decides to push and then the second Yang uh, decides to wait, then the collective action is push wait, which will result or will cause a transition from S0 to S1. So the new location will be S1. And then again, at this location, uh, the robots have actions available. So notice that here, the first robot, Ian, has one more act possible action, which is park. So that if Ian takes the action part, then no matter what the other robot will do, but the trolley will move from S1 to S3, where it will be kind of parked forever. And so, so I hope this, uh, this example is clear enough and uh, gives you some good intuition of what 
multi-agent transition systems are. And if not, then now is the time to ask. OK, now. So uh, let me now give you a, a more formal definition because I'll be referring to it later in the talk. <laughs> So a multi-agent transition system is a tuple of, uh, of uh, well, things. First, a finite set of agents or players. Then there is also a set of states, the system. Uh, there is a set of possible actions, which is a rather set of names of actions, and it is global. It applies to all states and to all agents. But then uh, there is also a mapping, which at every state, to every agent will assign a subset of actions that are available to that agent at that state. So the idea being that uh, not every action is available to every agent. At A. So this will determine what, what are the actions that the agent can actually choose from at the given state. Uh, so that for any state, we can consider the set of action profiles that are available that is consisting of individual actions that are available to the respective agents, and this will be my notation for the set of action profiles. Then there is an outcome function or a transition function, which at every state and every action profile, which is available at that state, will assign a unique successful state or outcome state. So, this is the mapping that determines the transitions in the system. And then, uh, well, in order to uh, use a formal logical language to reason about uh, such models, we need a set of atomic propositions that uh, are evaluated at states. So they describe properties of states, like winning state, losing state, safe state, and so on. And then we have a labeling of state description function, which to every state assigns the set of atomic propositions that are to the All right. So that's the formal definition. And well, it's it's quite easy. I'm not going to spend time, but it's quite easy to recast the example that I gave you earlier as a formal multi-agent transition system. Now, uh, a few words about the basic logic of or for coalition or strategic reasoning that was introduced in the early 2000s and the PhD thesis of Mark Pauli on logic for social software and uh, under the name of coalition logic. So that logic is a multimodal logic. It extends classical position logic with a whole family of strategic model operators, which are uh, parameterized with uh, sets of agents, or as we'll call them, coalitions of agents. So for every set or coalition of agents C, we have one model operator, box C. So that's how the language looks. And uh, the intuitive reading of these uh, strategic model operators is as follows. So box C phi intuitively means to say that the coalition C has a joint action that ensures an outcome state satisfying phi. So phi is again a formula in the language which now describes the goal of this coalition. So uh, this uh, joint action of the coalition C ensures that whatever the outcome state is, but it, it will satisfy phi that is regardless of how all other agents act, phi will be true at the outcome uh, uh, from the current state, at the outcome state. Let me give you some ideas, some flavor of properties that one can uh, express, one can formalize in this language. So first, referring to the previous example, uh, this formula says that if in has an action to ensure that the trolley is parked, then Yang cannot prevent the trolley from being parked. And uh, you should intuitively see that this must be a validity in this uh, logic, indeed, because that's by the very meaning of what it means to ensure something. And if, if you have an action or a strategy to ensure something, then the whole rest of the world cannot prevent you from doing so. Uh, 
Here is another example, again, not now not referring to uh, that example. Uh, so there are two agents A and B, and the goal is some atomic proposition that refers to the uh, to A goal state, state satisfying goal. So this formula says that uh, A nor B has an action ensuring an outcome satisfying goal, but they both together have a joint action that ensures such an outcome. And uh, intuitively, you should be able to see that, well, this formula, uh, this, uh, uh, well, this statement is satisfiable because uh, indeed the power of a coalition of agents is or can be greater than the sum of the powers of the individual agents. And indeed, you can easily uh, see how it can be satisfied in the example that I gave you earlier. And uh, well, here is a bit more involved example that shows that once you start nesting such strategic operators, then you can see things that are well, much more, let's say, involved. Like uh, A, B, and C are some correlations here. And what this formula says is that the coalition A has a joint action to ensure that at the outcome state, whichever it is, but at that outcome state, if the coalition B has a joint action to achieve its goal, goal B, then, oops, then the coalition C does not have a joint action to achieve or to ensure its goal. So these are just some examples to illustrate things that one can say in this language. And uh, I will not go in more details. That was just a background uh, for uh, on which I will be building the uh, logical system that I'll present here. But let me say a few words uh, about some uh, well extensions of this uh, coalition logic that have been studied uh, in quite some detail over the years. So first, uh, there are several extensions with temporal operators to specify long-term strategic reasoning not just one step, one uh, one shot, but uh, in long term. And the most popular of them is the so-called alternating time temporal logic ATL, and there are many variations of it. Uh, another family of extensions are epistemic extensions that add explicitly a knowledge of the agents into the picture, both in the semantics and in the language. And uh, the third family of extensions which I've been working uh, lately are uh, what I call logics for strategic reasoning in social context. And uh, I just mentioned three recent uh, case studies here. One is the socially friendly coalition logic. The other one, the logic of coalition or goal assignments. And the third is the logic for conditional strategic reasoning. But I'll not say more on them. Uh, if you are interested, have a look at the uh, one of the references that I mentioned. It's kind of a, a, a overview paper on this. Right. So this was my background, and now let me proceed with the main story of this talk: modeling multi-agent systems with normative constraints. So I will start with a very simple and uh, kind of allegoric example. You don't need to take it uh, verbatim, but you can see through this example. Uh, what what kind of scenarios we want to model? A group of agents with a shared resource. So think of a group of people that are called agents uh, that has a shared, let's say, pot with money, let's say euro coins, uh, to which they each have an access. So that every day, each of them, one at a time, opens the pot and possibly takes some money out of it or put some money into the pot. So that the current state of the system is determined by the amounts of money in the pot and in each of the agents. And the possible available actions for any agents uh, or the possible actions, not necessarily available, the possible actions for any agents are add some coins to the pot, pick out some coins from the pot, or do nothing. So uh, at any given state, the available actions of any agents are or can be constrained. First, there are obvious constraints, namely uh, no one can take more money from the pot than, the, than what is available in the pot. 
but also uh, the amount that an agent can put in the pot, of course, cannot exceed what the agent currently has on, uh, in his or her pot. So there are kind of hard constraints that are impossible to, to avoid. But there are also soft constraints, and these are the normative constraints that I'm going to introduce in the reason about. But before that, so what can be the possible objectives or goals of the agent? So for instance, it can be that an agent may want to gradually collect certain amount of, of money from the pot, or that the agent may want to accumulate certain amount of money in the pot, like build up some reserve, or just to keep the pot non-empty and so on. There's some examples to illustrate the kind of goals that we may want to reason about. And uh, now, what about normative constraints? So uh, I'm going to define a kind of very basic, very simple notion of normative constraints. So a system of normative constraints will consist here of just two types of, of uh, constraints on actions. Again, assuming some globally defined set of actions. The first type is permissible actions. So these are actions which are assumed to be the same for all agents. They are specific to the system state. That is, every state of the system, there is a set of actions that are permissible to any of the agents. So they are treated equally by the society, so to speak. And then the second type is uh, obligatory sets of actions, which are now assumed to be specific for each agent and also to, uh, uh, to uh, every state of the system. So the idea being that uh, each of the agents must choose an action from the set of actions that are obligatory for that agent. Choose one of those actions to perform. Again, this is a very simple setup and one can, uh, of course, elaborate this with, with other type of prohibitions and, and other kind of well, collectively permissible obligatory actions and so on. I will say some uh, a few words if I have time at the end, but now I want to present a very simple basic framework here. Uh, so now uh, we can define several different types of behaviors of an agent. For instance, we can say that a behavior is socially permissible if the agent always, uh, sorry, if the agent only performs permissible actions. Or uh, behavior is individually compliant if the agent always performs obligatory actions. And so, of course, we need to make some natural assumptions. For instance, a version of Kant's principle would say that for every agent at every state, at least one of the obligatory actions is permissible. But this is kind of an aside. <clears throat> now, so uh, the idea now is to extend the notion of multi agent transition system that I defined earlier with the system of normative constraints. Uh, so that intuitively, what I call a mass multi agent system with normative constraints is just a multi agent transition system where every state is endowed with a local system of normative constraints. So formally, it's a tuple that uh, has two more components on top of what you have seen already as multi-agent transition system. There are two more components. One of them is a mapping, uh, which uh, at every state will assign a sub subset of actions, and these are the actions that are permissible at that state. Uh, and the other one is a mapping, which at every state would assign to every agent a subset of actions, and these are this is the set of obligatory actions for that agent. So again, obligatory actions are supposed to be individually specified for every agent. And uh, again, we make this assumption that at least one obligatory action is permissible as well for every agent. Right, so these are the two additional components that uh, specify what is permissible and what is obligatory. So that for any state of the system, we can define the set of permissible action profiles that consist of actions that are permissible for all agents. Now, back to the uh, example. Uh, so I will give you some kind of a reasonable system or common sense reasonable system 
of normative constraints for the example of the shared pot with money. Just to, to give you a flavor of how that to work in practice. Say, so suppose that first, if the amount uh, in the pot is below the prescribed minimum, let's say 10 coins, then the only permissible actions are to add coins or to do nothing. So no one is permitted to take out money when when the, 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 uh, the content is below uh, this minimum. Uh, and in that case, so for instance, adding one or more coins can also be defined as obligatory actions, and that need not be for all agents. And so in my example, these are obligatory actions for just for uh, only for, let's say, two of the agents, let's say Ann and Bob. And uh, of course, they are, they can only be obligatory when they have some money uh, in their pockets. So uh, again, whether the action is obligatory or not depends on the current state, and the current state is defined in terms of not only what's in the pot, but also what the agents have. But for instance, it need not be obligatory for yet another agent, Charlie, because uh, Charlie is a child or is currently unemployed and so on. Okay. Then, if the amount in the pot is above the prescribed minimum, then the permissible actions uh, can be also add one or more coins or do nothing or take out some coins, but not more than what would leave at least the prescribed minimum in the pot. So, the idea being that a permissible action should be one that should not, after performed, should not leave the content of the part below the, the prescribed minimum. And in that case, the obligatory actions for Ann and Bob uh, can be defined as, well, adding coins to the pot whenever they have more money than the amount in the pot. So, anyway, there's just some, some, some example to, to give you an idea. Nothing that is really very deep or essential. So, now we want to reason about the abilities of the agents to act strategically so as to achieve given uh, goals that may be one shot or long term goals. I will not consider a temporal dimension here. There will be no temporal operators in the logic that I'll introduce so that the temporality will be kind of compactified, it will be uh, uh, compressed in, in, in one shot actions. So, I'm going to briefly present this logic for strategic reasoning with normative constraints. And uh, some, uh, some terminology and some notation that I need to set. Given a set of proponent agents C, the complement of this set, I will be calling the opponent agent so that again, once we fix a, a, a group, a coalition of agents, then we talk about proponents and opponents. And so, depending on the behavior of the proponent and the opponent agents, we can distinguish several types of strategic abilities for the proponent agents to achieve a given objective. Yeah. For instance, we can talk about unconditional strategic ability. This is when the behavior of both proponents and opponent agents is unconstrained. And this is precisely the kind of uh, abilities and the reasoning about them that is captured by the logics that I mentioned earlier, coalition logic and the temporal extension. So they formalize reasoning about unconditional abilities. Agents are unconstrained by any soft constraints, and their opponents can also act in any possible way. So they are, let's say, typically assumed to be either uh, random or adversaries. But usually that is not the case. So uh, we can now also talk about unconditional, socially permissible strategic abilities. This is when the proponent agents, they only act in a socially permissible way. That is, they may only apply permissible actions, whereas uh, the opponents can do anything. So the good guys, they uh, abide by the norms, uh, do only permissible things, whereas the bad guys can do anything that they want. That's the, roughly the idea. 
uh, or we can also talk about globally socially permissible ability when uh, where uh, well uh, the behavior of both opponent proponent and opponent agents is socially permissible and so on. so again depending on the uh, type of behavior for opponent proponents and opponents we can specify different we can consider different scenarios so these are just some of them that I mentioned. All right, so uh, all these kind of abilities will be uh, modeled in a uniform way in this logical framework that I will present here. <coughs> uh, so uh, again, in the term strategy that I'll be using here, uh, I will use it in, in a generic uh, kind of symbolic sense, even though I'll be referring to one shot actions of the agents. Uh, not really to long-term goals, but that can, of course, be added to the language and to the picture. So, uh, formally, given a background system of normative constraints, we can consider two parameters, this small c bold and c bar. And these two parameters will be used to indicate a class of normative constraints in the system that respectively apply to the proponent agents and to the opponent agents. And I'll explain what I mean. So uh, first, the possible values for each one of these are, again, in this framework that I present here, there are three possible values. A, no constraints. P, socially permissible actions or strategies. That is, the agents in C only perform permissible actions. And O, for individually compliant actions and strategies, where the agents in C always perform obligatory actions. And so uh, we can likewise distinguish these three versions for the uh, opponent agents, that is for the parameter C bar. <clears throat> so this logic for strategic reasoning with normative constraints that I'm going to introduce is again a multimodal logic which features a family of model operators of this type. So what we have here is first we have the coalition of proponent agency and then we have the two constraints, uh, the top one specifying the normative constraints applying to the proponents and the bottom C bar to the opponents and then phi is the goal or the objective of the proponents. Yeah, this is this is a bit of a rather heavy notation, but um, I could not do with any simpler one. So anyway, this type of model operators will formalize the respective versions of the uh, abilities and, and um, uh, constraints in uh, the following statement. So here is the uniform uh, intuitive reading. Given a background system of normative constraints, the agent or the group of agents C as a strategy, respectively joint strategy, complying with the normative constraints specified in the class C, so this is the top parameter here, that would ensure achievement of the goal phi against any behavior of the opponent agents, C bar, respectively complying with the normative constraints in the class or the parameter C bar here as a subscript. So I hope that makes good sense. Let me try and repeat it briefly. So the idea of what this operator says is that C is the group of agents. These are the proponents. Their objective is phi or it's formalized by the formula phi. They want to ensure that the formula phi, whatever it says, will become true. Now, the top parameter here specifies the normative constraints that we assume that uh, will be applied by or will be abide, uh, abided by the uh, proponent agency. And C bar is respectively the constraints that would apply to the uh, opponent agents. And so that the statement that this formula says is that under the specified assumptions, this group of proponent agents has a joint action to ensure the total phi. And so I'll give you some examples. For instance, 
well, in the case where uh, both parameters are set to A, this formalizes the claim that C has unconditional strategic ability to achieve the objective phi. When the top parameter is P for permissible, that accordingly formalizes the claim that C has an unconditional but socially permissible strategic ability to achieve phi against any behavior of the opponents. Or when both parameters are set to P, that would formalize the claim that C has a globally socially permissible strategic ability to achieve phi and so on. So I hope you get the general idea. And of course, there are three times three, nine different cases, but I'm not going to all them. All right, so let me now give you some uh, formal details of the system, first the language and then uh, formal semantics. So we fix a set of, of agents uh, denoted by AGT and then uh, a set of atomic propositions. And based on these, we are building the language, which is essentially, again, a multimodal propositional language where the older model operators have this type, which I have intuitively explained earlier. So back to the example uh, with the shared pot with money. So uh, here are some claims about that example that we can formalize in this language, uh, uh, taking into account the system of normative constraints that I described earlier. And uh, suppose there are just three agents in, in the story, uh, and Bob and Charlie, uh, they're noted respectively by A, B, and C. Here is one example. So for instance, uh, take this atomic proposition pot non-empty, which is true in those states where the pot is not empty. And what this uh, simple formula says is that N has the strategic ability to ensure that the pot stays non empty if, if all agents perform permissible actions. That is, assuming that all the three involved agents per only perform permissible actions, then the claim is that N has the ability to make sure that the pot will never become empty. Right. And so, in fact, for this particular example that I gave you, assuming that it was non-empty at the beginning, this is in fact true. This is ensured by, by the normative constraints that I described. Another example, of now a formula that is not true, which is almost the same, except that now the opponents, that is Bob and Charlie, are uh, assumed to apply any actions, not just permissible, but any actions that are available to them. That is, if they can both kind of abuse the system, then this is no longer true. If that, to be more precise, if Bob and Charlie can just keep taking money from the pot, regardless of, of how much is there, then of course they can eventually manage to empty it and, and cannot prevent this uh, acting in a permissible way. And maybe not at all. Uh, another example, say, suppose that Q is a proposition which stands for Charlie eventually gets all the money from the pot. Uh, well, then uh, this formula saying that Charlie has the permissible uh, well, ability, that is, well, there is a uh, globally permissible uh, ability to ensure Q, this is not true. That is, if Charlie acts in, in only in a permissible way, then Charlie should not be able to eventually get all the money. But if Charlie acts in any possible way against uh, the other agents acting in a permissible way, then this will become true, and so on. So I hope you get the idea. Right, so. Uh, OK, well, there are a couple more examples. Let me see, how am I doing time-wise? How much more time? You give me before you, I start you the have, vision. Uh, you have 10, 15 minutes. Left. Ah, OK, all right. So now I should be done within 10 minutes. All right, so here is yet another example. So I want to build up some 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 demand for 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 formal semantics here. So my examples will become less obvious now. So suppose that for any integer n, we will consider this uh, proposition qn, which stands for Charlie eventually collects n coins from the pot. So that uh, this formula was saying that Charlie has the unconditional ability to make QN true uh, uh, 
assuming that the other agents act in only in a permissible way, uh, it is true for some small enough, and this is supposed to be a, a closing bracket, sorry, but it is not true for larger ends. Right. So you can imagine this. But well, if you start building really some formula that would involve uh, proposition connectors, like even simple implications like this, this formula which says if and has the ability by only applying obligatory actions to ensure that the pot is non-empty, assuming that all the other agents can apply any actions, then is it true that then Charlie has the ability by only applying, uh, but by applying any actions to ensure that Charlie will eventually collect N coins, assuming that the others are, are, are individually compliant? Or well, yet another example, which I'm not going to read. Uh, the point that I'm making here is that things become increasingly less and less obvious. And I mean, answering these questions should not be an obvious thing. So that uh, we need uh, we need a formal semantics. That's my point. So in the remaining five ten minutes, I'm going to outline formal semantics. I'll not give you all the technical details. They they get a bit heavier, but at least. The feeling how semantics can be defined, and then I'll wrap up. So, formal semantics is based on these uh, kind of models uh, with normative constraints that I described earlier. And I need some more terminology here. So, given a group of agents C, a joint action for C, formally, this is just a tuple of individual actions. So, we say that the joint action sigma C complies with the normative constraints in the class C at the given state S if every individual action in this joint action does so. So that given the classes of, of these parameters C and C bar that specify the normative constraints applying respectively to the proponent coalition C and the opponent C bar, well, then the set of action profiles at, at, at the state S, is, uh, which is composed from C compliant joint actions for the proponent coalition C and C bar compliant joint actions for C bar, I'm going to denote in this way. Right? So uh, this is not readable, but you can see it, I hope. So uh, this is the, 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 the fundamental technical notion that we need the set of uh, uh, all actions that are that correspond to their uh, respective to the normative constraints that are specified, and so uh, we need for every such a uh, such a joint action, we need to define the set of possible outcomes with respect to these parameters. So how are they defined? Well. Define the way you would expect, so I'm not going to read it. Classified. Uh, so, given the state S, given the joint action for the proponent coalition C, and given these parameters C and C bar, we define precisely the set of possible joint actions or action profiles that will correspond to these constraints. For each one of these action profiles, we have a unique outcome state. And the set of all these outcome states will define the set of possible outcomes with respect to these constraints. So, in the long run, we have for every such parameters, we have the set of possible outcomes that would correspond to joint to action profiles which uh, comply with these parameters. Okay, that is the most technical thing that I needed to kind of define here so that now I can define the notion of truth of a formula with a given state in a given model. And it is defined in the well-known way for model logic for all proposition connectives. And now we come to the generic clause for these strategic operators. So uh, what you see here is nothing really new. It's just formalizing the intuition that I gave you earlier. So I'm not gonna read it, but this is just to uh, demonstrate how we can make formal this intuitive idea of what that means. And again, if that's still not clear, do ask me in the Q&A. Uh, I'll get back to this <coughs> formal definition. 
So now, all right, well, we want to not only be able to specify things, that is to formalize uh, um, well, property issue requirements, but we want to be able to check the truth of such formula. And in fact, that can be done algorithmically by modifying the well-known, well, the well there is a well-known model checking algorithm for coalition logic. Uh, and uh, it, it can be modified in a suitable way to work here. And this is because essentially each one of these fancy operators here, it is in fact, or can be read as a standard coalition logic operator, but acting in a suitably modified models of multi-agent transition systems. In other words, so uh, here is a, a well-known phenomenon that uh, there are some fancy operators like, well, let's say, in dynamic epistemic logic typically, but also others, which uh, require certain updates or certain transformation of the model. So once you do this, then you can actually uh, evaluate the truth of these operators. Uh, in a very simple way, that is, they become standard operators after you do a suitable update of the model. So this is a similar situation. Each one of these operators can be reduced down to a standard collision logic after a due modification of the model, which in this case is fairly simple. Okay. And by the way, just to mention this, so these operators that I define here, they are uh, kind of variations of the operators for proactive ability or alpha effectivity, as game theory would call it, in the logic for conditional strategic reasoning that I mentioned in this recent paper with, with Finko and Joe. Now, <clears throat> okay, so lastly, uh, since I'm speaking to uh, at least some of you are being logicians, so that maybe you are craving for some axiomatic system for this logic. Uh, and even if you're not, then it might be uh, uh, of some interest to see how one can go about axiomatizing the validity. And so you could imagine that this is quite a bulky uh, job, and so it's still under construction, but still, first, we can build on top of the axioms and rules for coalition logic that are well known that I did not present. And, Yes, but uh, you can see them in our Pauli's thesis. And so we can extend these axioms and rules for these fancy operators that I introduce here. And uh, some of them extend in a fairly straightforward way. So for instance, the A maximality says that uh, if the anti coalition cannot ensure phi under the given normative constraints, then the, that simply means that there is at least one play or at least one outcome where phi is true. And so therefore, the grand coalition of all agents can ensure that. Safety, all right, well, no one can ensure the falsehood to become true. Liveness, well, everyone can ensure the truth to be true. And superadditivity, which is the single most interesting axiom scheme here, which says that uh, if you have two disjoint coalitions, C1 and C2, and under the same assumptions for the uh, normative constraints for these coalitions and their opponents, if C1 can ensure an outcome satisfying phi1, and C2 can ensure an outcome satisfying phi2, then them being disjoint, they can join forces. And so the union of the two coalitions can ensure an outcome that satisfies both phi1 and phi2. And you can imagine that this requirement for disjointness is essential because if they are not disjoint, then maybe uh, agents that are common for the two coalitions, they might have to do some well, uh, incompatible actions to ensure both goals. Anyway, this again comes from coalition logic, but this scheme can, can be refined further, and so you will see a bit more on, on the next slide, by considering different uh, C and C bar for the different coalitions. So there is some extra technical work to be done to adjust this. Uh, then there is this monotonicity rule, which uh, also comes from coalition logic, and now it is simply decorated with the normative constraints in the model operators. Well, this is what comes directly from coalition logic, but there are some additional axioms that uh, come here that need to be added. And I'll give you a list of a flavor of some of them. So for instance, the notion of, of super additivity can be refined in a way that would assume different uh, constraints for, uh, for the coupon in C1 and C2. And then for the joint coalition or the union of the two, 
to claim that they can ensure both goals, we need to take the intersection, roughly speaking, of the two constraints. So, for instance, if C1 is allowed to do anything, but C2 may only do permissible actions, then when we consider a joint coalition, we need to restrict their behavior to socially permissible behavior and so on, kind of things. Well, then there are some fairly simple, like monotonistic requirements that I'm not going to uh, discuss in detail. Uh, and uh, a few other simple uh, schemes that come into the picture. And in fact, I do not I, I do not claim yet that I have the complete axiomatization because I am slowly kind of trying to prove complete axioms on demand, so to speak. So, so this is still under construction. But anyway, uh, if you are if you care about uh, well, deciding validities and satisfiabilities, then one can actually prove that this logic is decidable without having complete axiomatization, and simply because it has a finite three model property. And so much on the logical technicality, so let me wrap up. So, what I'm presented here again is a work in early stage of progress. And so there is a long term lies ahead, both in uh, on the conceptual development and on technical results. Uh, and I'll mention just some possible directions. So first, refining the language by specifying individual normative constraints for every agent, as well as collective normative constraints that apply to groups of agents rather than just uh, to every individual of them. That's one direction. Uh, another one would be to enrich the system of strategic operators, for instance, add analogs of these operators that I mentioned, the proacting ability, reactive ability, and so on. Uh, importantly, add explicit temporal operators, like well, always or eventually or until, to specify long-term goals so that we can really talk about strategies here and strategic long-term strategic behavior. Take agents' knowledge into formal account, both in the semantics and uh, in the language, which is a uh, The agents' knowledge about what the others are doing, but also about the normative constraints that apply or that are assumed for the other agents is of crucial importance. So that everyone in the society is normal abiding, then uh, I will know more about what I can achieve. In, by acting one or another way, but if I know nothing, if I cannot assume anything. Yeah. And of course, there are the technical questions of axiomatizing, logics, and all this, and eventually building a kind of a toolbox for model checking and for doing formal deductive reasoning for these logic and various extensions. So, so the ultimate goal of this project is to build a kind of universal logic based framework for strategic reasoning uh, with normative constraints, and this is still somewhere early in the road towards this goal. That's the end of my talk. Thank you.